thank you very much. You guys hear me okay? A little bit? Okay. So, as you said, my name is Jessica Grootman. I'm an analyst and senior researcher with Altimeter Group. Here today to talk to you about customer experience in the Internet of Things. Um, this is a report I just published about a month ago that I'm going to talk through five ways or use cases that consumer-facing brands can engage customers using IoT. Um, and I just want to take this, this time for a second to invite your collaboration. This is definitely an ongoing source of research for me and a research stream. All things IoT, um, I'll talk about the next report I'm working on in a little bit, but I invite your questions, your examples, you know, your collaboration. Um, it's, it's a very interesting and young space. When I started looking at the space about three or four years ago, it occurred to me that although IoT is not a mature space, to the extent that it is mature, it is more so in the B2B side. Um, and so I really wanted to look at well, what can this look like, what does this look like uh, from B2C? We hear a lot about connected, you know, fill in the blank, connected belts, connected flower pots, everything under the sun, but ultimately how do we sort of step back and take more of a technology agnostic approach um, to how brands can really use this to engage customers? Um, so I'm going to talk, whoop, slip forward a bit, I'm going to talk about what this looks like from a consumer side. We'll go through the five use cases, I'll show you some examples of each, as well as the sub-use cases. Um, and then how to pull all of this together for more of a holistic approach to IoT as a brand. So something interesting happened in 2014, and that was that mobile outpaced desktops and laptops. Um, what this means is that there are now more mobile users in the world than there are those users of desktops and laptops. You know, Cisco, we all know this, this is why we're looking at the space. This is obviously paced to be a huge, huge um, revolution, as we just talked about. Cisco, Gartner, MIT, McKinsey, all these companies are predicting that within just five years, this is going to hit between 50 billion and 200 billion devices. Now, what this means for brands and for all of us is that not only will IoT connected devices outpace desktops and laptops, um, but mobile devices and tablets as well combined. This shakes out to somewhere between, certainly on the high end, um, 26 smart objects per person. Today we have in the US about three average, World over, that number is between either zero or technically two to four. Um, but ultimately, we can see this from a, from a brand standpoint as windows of opportunity to engage customers and also windows of opportunity to understand how they're engaging with our products and services. So we're kind of seeing the underpinnings of this take place today. It's no surprise that the top two box here of how people are accessing the internet is indeed laptops and desktops as well as mobile devices. But increasingly, we're seeing things like smart gaming systems, smart TVs, smart watches, um, fitness trackers and wearables. And what this really means from a consumer standpoint is that this is transforming how individuals like you and I think about what the internet is and how it's defined and how we consume it. This is a framework from the report I just published to really sort of contextualize um, how to view the internet of things and sort of this uh, brand consumer paradigm. On the far left here is sort of the beginnings of traditional media. Think of print, radio, billboards. This was a one-way communication where brands really set the agenda. You fade in and fade out. My, my voice? Yeah, because Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do this. Sorry. <laughs> better? Better? Yeah. Okay. Um, broadcast model. Really kind of a one-way. Brands set the agenda in this. They created content, displayed it out to, to consumers, and there wasn't really much dialogue happening. This happened over time through traditional media. Enter the advent of the internet and social media when what, was, what really kind of fundamentally changed was this dialogue model, where not only could brands communicate with consumers, but co consumers could communicate back to brands and also amongst each other through things like digital media, as we know, through social media. And this was happening increasingly in real time, but still w to some degree with a delay. Now enter object voice, or object in this case could be anything from connected products to smart devices, to people, to our pets, to our loved ones, to connected infrastructure. We can now add a sensor to effectively anything. And that means that there's this sort of connectivity model or multi-way communications model where brands can not only communicate directly with consumers, directly with objects or products, but these objects and products and these consumers can all communicate back and between and amongst each other. Um, at Altimeter, we call this, this contextual media, um, and the idea here is, yes, this is indeed digital media that is used as sort of this atomic particle of, of brand and how brands communicate with consumers, um, but it's really driven by sensors and by location-aware, time-aware, you know, temperature-aware, whatever the case may be, um, but sensors are what are driving this, this sort of contextualized, highly specific media. 
And this is happening indeed in real time, but also increasingly, as you all know, um, through predictive technology. I wanted to take a second here to just sort of parse out what's sort of the differences fundamentally between consumer IoT and enterprise IoT. Um, and I'll state the obvious, these are consumers. We're all people and ultimately employees and businesses are made up of people, but the buying cycles are much shorter, typically speaking. Price considerations are much shorter. Um, we think about sort of the incentive to adopt is, is much lower. There has to be a much higher value proposition for consumers than say for employees who are not necessarily paying for this. Um, and so there's this really kind of imperative for a value exchange. I talk extensively in the report about this idea of win-win, this what's in it for me and this being a real challenge, but also a huge opportunity for brands to really prove why would I adopt this in the first place? What is it, what's, this, what's a problem that's actually being solved here? Another big difference between consumer IoT and enterprise IoT, and it's not to say this doesn't exist in enterprise, it's just really, I think, more pervasive in consumer, is that it's very mobile-centric today. So many of the applications and the examples that we see of connected products really require a smartphone. I call it the umbilical cord. Apple Watch is a great example. They require a smartphone to, to you know, really extract the full value um, of what the connected product um, really offers. And finally, I just mentioned the value exchange, but I'll go ahead and plug my next research report. Um, the, the report that I just published and that we'll walk through outlines the potential of IoT, and we'll talk about these use cases, what this can look like, we'll look at examples of how this looks today. Um, but I fundamentally believe that ultimately this will not come to pass if companies cannot transform the way that they convey to consumers how they're using their data. Transparency in communications and why, again, the value being solved, um, but also sort of ethics. And as I always say, it's one thing to be sort of creeped out online and then close the laptop and walk away from the laptop and sort of leave that freakiness in the box, so to speak. Um, but increasingly, as we move sensors um, and connected experiences into the physical world, we can't close the laptop and walk away. And so I think fundamentally, um, this requires a completely different approach to messaging um, and communications than, than brands are uh, accustomed to today. So let's get into it. Consumer-facing use cases in the IoT. This is really the flagship uh, framework of the report, and I'll go through each one of these. Five use cases and about 15 sub-use cases. Um, but the idea here is, again, to really step back from beacons, wearables, touchscreens, whatever the case may be, and ask, how are we going to do this? What, is, what are the business objectives? We're taking a technology agnostic approach, once again. So let's start with reward. This is about rewarding consumers for their time, money, effort, and engagement. Um, a classic example of promotion that we've all heard of, Macy's has been doing this for a few years now. I walk by a beacon and I receive a coupon for that product. Um, simple idea, sort of an extension of, of mobile marketing as we know it, mobile uh, advertising. Gamification is another example. We'll look, uh, another sub-use case, we'll look at an example from Walgreens in just a second. And the idea here is really sort of gamifying a physical space such that not only can it kind of look and feel um, like a video game, but those, that sort of psychology of gamification, of receiving points for doing something, um, for engaging in a specific way with a product or environment is what actually dri drives people to um, engage. Entertainment um, is another use case, and we've seen some of this as in, um, you know, if you go to Disneyland, you walk by a sensor and say music will play, or something perhaps that's more specific or more contextually aware. But this could be something aesthetic, as in music or sound or lighting, um, but it could also be access to exclusive content. So we'll look at an example from Diageo of that. This is the Walgreens example. Walgreens has been running a pilot um, since about, about a year ago, June of 2014, where they are gamifying their in-store experience by using augmented reality. I'm kind of a sucker for augmented reality. I think it's really interesting. So there's a few uh, AR examples in here. But the idea here is by integrating uh, your loyalty program with Walgreens, they're able to serve you up um, an ad as I'm walking through the store. We know you're looking for laundry detergent. Go down here, you can pass a few coins on the way. You'll get a few points in your uh, loyalty membership. And again, it kind of has this feel of a video game. It's just sort of fun, entertaining, reward. Example from Diageo, um, this is very interesting. A couple of years ago, they, they deployed this program where they attached 100,000 different unique QR codes to bottles of Johnny Walker Texas Red. Diageo is kind of a holding company of a lot of different types of um, liquors. And so initially this campaign was a Father's Day campaign. It was snap the bottle of um, whiskey and it'll take you directly to a Facebook page where you can opt in. By the way, they got 100,000 unique um, CRM opt-ins out of this initial two-week pilot. 
and then it will take you to, it will pull in your Facebook data and create a customized piece of content of you and your father. Um, you can see in the video here, you can actually watch this online. It's just sort of a thanks for raising me, warm and fuzzies, we love you dad, here have a bottle of liquor. Um, and again, in this two week pilot, 72% increase in sales. Um, and what, one of the things I really like about this example is although this was sort of launched as kind of a marketing campaign, what they found was that the supply chain visibility that this enabled was, was a huge value in, in something that they didn't necessarily foresee um, at the onset. They have since expanded this program um, to include six more countries and I think two or three other different product lines. All right. Next use case is information and decision making. I like to think about this as right content, right place, right time, kind of that marketing holy grail. Um, the idea here is to really empower customers to act on and access um, intelligence. So we think about this as navigation, as one of the big sub-use cases here, GPS, wayfinding, where do I find this product? Um, another one is evaluation, send me the right content, say I'm standing in front of the lawnmowers, um, and it sends me a comparison guide on the lawnmowers. Um, another very interesting uh, sub-use case is monitoring, and this is something that enterprises are, are long accustomed to. We're accustomed to having um, insight into how our you know, machines or connected products are performing, but you can actually bring this to the consumer level. Think tracking my steps. Think how much food does the dog have in his uh, you know, food bowl. Um, again, the idea here is enabling visibility in, in terms of quantifying what the experience looks like. How much wiper fluid do I have, how much windshield wiper fluid do I have in my car? Monitoring. And then finally, one of the interesting, kind of a surprise sub-use case I found in my research um, was this news as, as a form of information. And the idea here is that brands can really take um, sensor or device, empirical data from sensors and devices um, and kind of add to the conversation around public awareness. This is a content marketing play, this is a real-time marketing play. One of my favorite examples of this comes from Jawbone. Um, we had an earthquake here, I think up in Napa like a year ago. And Jawbone, you'll see in the red box down there, all data is anonymized and presented in aggregate. Very important point. But what they did was they pulled fitness tracker data and sleep, tra sleep tracking data um, from those Jawbone wearers in the immediate Bay Area, and they just produced a piece of content. It was a blog post of um, sleep, quality of sleep relative to the epicenter of the earthquake. A simple, it's just a simple piece of content, but again, the idea is just adding to the conversation as a brand. This is a way that brands can engage consumers, engage sort of the larger population um, using this unique device data. Navigation, an example here. I interviewed Home Depot for my report. Really, they're doing some really interesting things right now. Classic retail example, integrating their loyalty program with their dot-com um, and mobile in-store experience. So what this looks like is when you walk into the door, um, you receive a notification of, hi Jessica, how did painting your bedroom go? Do you need another 20% you know, off of this same color, seafoam green, whatever? Um, so again, it's kind of this customized, unique to me experience, which is an, actually an example of reward. Um, but also, if you're looking for a specific product, it will navigate you there based on you know, the inventory, is it actually there, and the most efficient route to navigate the store. If anyone has ever been to a Home Depot, these things are sort of labyrinths to uh, navigate. So again, just providing a little bit better experience based on sensor data, GPS, beacons, et cetera. Um, I love this example. I think, it's, uh, I think it's a very interesting example of just a simple tweak um, that really improves the experience. Here's me and my AR example again. You guys might have seen this one. This is a good example of evaluation from IKEA, solving the problem of what would that couch actually look like in my home? And here you can just hold up your device, pan over the corner of you know, whatever room that, you wanna, um, that you're shopping for. You can change the color, you can change the size, you can change different models, and indeed you can buy directly from the app. Now, facilitation, the third and admittedly probably my um, favorite use case <laughs> of those in the research. And the idea here is really just ex making the process, the exchange between brand and consumer easier. It's facilitating more convenient brand experiences, more streamlined access through authentication, through payment, through actually using a product, through doing this remotely or on site. Um, so we'll look at some examples here. Payment, a lot happening in the, mob in the mobile payment space. Um, obviously paying with wearables, Apple Pay is a great example, NFC enabled pay, QR codes, a lot of different things happening using sensors um, to pay. Obviously in the fall, um, 
uh, what is it, chip-based credit cards will be coming to the United States. So I think that's going to get a, a big boost from that standpoint. But payment as a sub-use case is a huge use case in and, in and unto itself. Identity is as well. This is the idea of identity authentication, um, streamlining the experience either for the individual or for products across multiple products. Every home automation vendor right now is thinking very deeply about identity. And it's very important, obviously, in terms of privacy and digital ethics. Who can access this data um, and how to streamline that experience but also secure it? Conversion is a very interesting sub-use case. Now, the idea here is taking what we think of with online conversion, an example of that would be downloading a white paper um, or registering for an event, and, and pulling in offline experiences or physical experiences and physical spaces to indicate you know, buying intent, how people are moving through stores. If I walk by the high heels six times while I'm in Target for 15 minutes, that probably means something to Target. Um, and so increasingly, we can use this data and the sensor data to really um, flesh that out for brands. Finally, utility, which is a catch-all category for enabling action to actually use a product or service. So this could be watering the lawn. This could be um, turning up a slow cooker. This could also be something that is not done remotely, but is done in real time. A gesture control, perhaps, for turning up or down the heat, um, turning on the music. Good example here, I interviewed these guys. Chamberlain, the smart garage door opener, um, this is a company that did not interact with customers except for maybe once every 20 years, right? And then by connecting their product, I mean, how often do you buy a connected garage door opener, right? Um, but, but, but by connecting their product, they're now able to see how individuals are using this product on a daily basis. Not only that, as the quote gets at, um, they're really looking at this to integrate with other pieces of home automation. So just completely transforming their visibility into product performance, but also how individuals are using this actual product. Great example of utility. Starbucks, I pulled this example. There's a lot happening, like I said, in mobile payment, but I like Starbucks. They, they were early to the mobile payment game, but what they fundamentally get here is that this really isn't about the technology. They integrate with all of these different things, Apple Watch, Galaxy Gear, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The point is just streamlining the transaction pro process no matter where it actually is. Um, good example of uh, conversion. There's an interesting company called Sohalo right now. There are a few companies doing this, um, but I interviewed Sohalo for my report. They're a vendor. And what they're doing is finding different ways to, again, um, track conversion while in store. So I, I gave the example of if I walk by the, the high heels three or four times, that probably means something. But actually incentivizing people to, or tracking as people walk down certain aisles of the store, um, as they, if they interact with a certain product in a certain way. Um, this can be a location-based event, or this can be a product-based event. But needless to say, there's a tremendous amount of information um, that brands can ascertain simply by tracking how people use things. And these doesn't necessarily have to be buying. This can just be behaviors and events, and that's really what conversion is about. Identity. Um, I like this example of identity, but I'll admit it's, it's not my favorite because it's very product-centric, and I think identity, identity fundamentally should be about the individual more so than the product. Um, but great example from Belkin Wemo, where it's really pulling together the fan and you know the coffee maker and the lamp and all these different things to just sort of create a connected experience across all of them for the individual based on this plug. Um, other, other interesting thing here from a brand standpoint is that this is pulling together all of these sub-brands. So these don't exist in silos anymore from an analytics and visibility standpoint. Um, just a little bit of a, an enterprise value prop there. But identity fundamentally makes the experience better for consumers because it makes it easier. We're accustomed to this um, in marketing through things like social login. And so I always think of social login um, as, as kind of a predecessor of you know, perhaps what IoT login could be in the future of sort of pulling these different data sets to make something easier to actually access. Service. Um, this is about supporting and retain customers by proactively identifying opportunities. And what this looks like is both enhancing reactive service that we're accustomed to. I have an issue, I call the service line, and they, um, they handle that issue. But also, increasingly, um, identifying ways to proactively um, resolve service. This is the classic example of you know, the refrigerator telling me I'm out of milk. This is something that's proactive rather than me realizing it. Um, Good example here is from Whirlpool. This is, again, a pretty simple example, but the idea is through the sensors in the washing machine, we're able to see that something is awry, something is not working, and this, sends, this automatically sends troubleshooting content. This is how you resolve it. Here's a five-step thing. Um, obviously, this is better for the consumer, not having to pick up the phone and wait and give all the information. No one's, you know, 
it's, it's different to have this on site in my home versus trying to convey what the actual issue is to a service agent on the phone. Um, again, a simple example, content, a content play yet again, um, troubleshooting content to help service this experience. Something a little bit more advanced, but you guys might have heard of this. Um, Tesla, the car that fixes itself. Tesla being a, effectively a, an operating system on wheels. Tesla had a recall, I think it was January of last year. Um, 29,000 cars were recalled due to a faulty charger um, for, for plugging the car in and charging it. But again, because Tesla is, is fundamentally sort of an operating system, they were able to deliver a software update to resolve this issue to all 29,000 customers over the air. This is a way better experience than driving to the dealership, waiting in line, sitting there and waiting, having the thing serviced. And it also saved Tesla a lot of labor costs um, and time not having to do that. It was, again, it was a software update. Um, also saved them some media shame and in fact gave them positive media lift. Finally, um, innovation is the, is the final use case. And this is on the more advanced side, um, but, but something that we're accustomed to already through our smart devices and through mobile devices. We're accustomed to getting software updates um, periodically on our, on our Androids and, and uh, Apple devices because this, again, is, is sort of this, increasingly we're getting into here um, this hardware-software paradigm of being able to service and both see how people are using the devices and how we can change those experiences Again, collecting feedback um, and also customizing those experiences based on what the devices are saying and based on what individuals are saying both explicitly using those devices and also implicitly not necessarily saying anything but just seeing how individuals are navigating the devices, um, how the devices are functioning, et cetera. Um, New England Biolabs is a really interesting example of this. I interviewed these guys for my report. They are a chemical reagent supplier for universities. Um, and so what they do fundamentally is they provide chemicals for university scientists to conduct their experiments. Um, now, a few years ago, they realized they have all these refrigerators and, and freezers in the field, but they don't really know how people are using them. The, the, you know, the support uh, process is kind of clunky. People are not so happy when um, these freezers go down. These reagents are very sensitive to temperature and other um, things like that. So what they did was they connected these freezers and as a result have been able to completely transform what this experience is like um, for their customers, not only in terms of what products they offer, where, to which universities, also in terms of marketing. This is a big content play. They're doing A-B testing on what sorts of content offers, free samples are sort of resonating based regionally. Um, they were able to better plan on inventory, what sorts of reagents do we supply in what areas. Again, this is very important because these things are very um, time sensitive and temperature sensitive, environment sensitive. Um, and of course, improve the performance of the freezers based on this. Um, my last example here around customization, I do love Tesla, so I have a couple of, of examples from them, but one of the, the, the great things about this is as a Tesla driver, um, a, you can submit a feature request. So if you're a driver and you want a request because it is sort of this operating system on wheels, you can say, you know, here's what I want. Now obviously, Tesla doesn't have to take every feature request, um, but recently a, a customer submitted a request for a crawl feature, and this is the idea. Here in California, we have awful traffic, as, as we all know, and this is driving three or four miles per hour um, in, in very heavy traffic. Now, Tesla liked this idea, and so they rolled this out um, to the individual, but they also rolled it out to their entire product fleet. So if you think about this idea of customization, not only at the individual level, but at sort of this crowdsourcing at scale level, this is really profound in terms of how companies can change and use the crowd to drive that innovation process in a much faster way than we're accustomed to today. All right, so I've taken you through the five use cases. It's a lot of information. Um, and again, this really outlines the potential of, indeed, what brands are doing today, but how fundamentally consumer-facing industries and brands can think about just how to engage customers that doesn't necessarily require one, you know, doesn't necessarily require a wearable, doesn't necessarily require a beacon. We've, the, in the examples that we've covered today, this is, again, fundamentally not about the technology, it's about all of these different pieces coming together to really serve a, a use case or a business objective. But this is not about any one use case, fundamentally. Although it's low-hanging fruit to you know, send someone a coupon as they walk by the high heels, um, this is much more interesting and much more rich when we pull together 
this around the entire customer lifecycle. And what I found in the research was that although facilitation and service and all these use cases have different um, applications at different phases of the, of the buying cycle, there's sort of this logic or flow where reward happens around the awareness period. You can see this graph. Information is around consideration. Facilitation helps the actual experience of the product service and support, and then innovation helps drive brand loyalty, brand advocacy through customization. So I'm gonna look at an example of that. Fundamentally, the objective here is not to send people coupons, as I just said, but to really place the brand centrally and kind of intuitively. How would my customers actually, what, what do they actually need? Um, what problem are we actually solving? How do we sort of be central to their pain point? That's what this is fundamentally about, and that's really the great potential of the Internet of Things and customer experience. Um, so just a quick example here of McDonald's. This is a simple example, but I like this. Um, a mobile play, for sure. When you walk in the store, you receive way more than a coupon. All of these different things here. A greeting, based on who you are. Indeed, a coupon. Um, alerts, contests, surveys. What do you think of this? Q&A, who's not going to wonder what pink slime actually is? Um, and also employment opportunities, which is interesting. And so what I like about this example is that uh, McDonald's is trying to adhere to a while they're in the actual store um, feedback loop. So if I submit an um, application for employment, they're trying to get back to that applicant in the amount of time that they're still in the store. They're trying to answer questions in the amount of time that they're still in the store. Um, also through things like facilitation, I just kind of outlined here how this expands the entire customer life cycle. Um, but you can see here, through conversion, what sorts of recruiting programs are working where? Um, what sorts of products are resonating in what regions? This is an early program, but you can see how McDonald's is really thinking beyond the coupon here. This is really about kind of giving people a reason to engage um, and expanding beyond just <laughs> um, you know, Q&A or just a, a, a coupon and really sort of driving a better in-store experience. You know, what was the staff like? What were the facilities like? How was your experience dining? What did you think of this new product, et cetera? Four weeks of this pilot, um, more than 18,000 coupon redemptions. Sales went up for both chicken, McChicken, McChicken nuggets, and, or sorry, McChickens and McNuggets. That's incredibly hard to say. Um, and again, this is really just driving intelligence. A simple example here, but you can see how this is really a win-win. This is a better experience for customers, a better experience for McDonald's. Um, I'll close on this. We've probably all heard of Disney's Magic Band, but I think this is one of the most advanced, um, really, applications of consumer-facing IoT today. And that's because this wearable, the Magic Band itself, really serves as not only an identity portal, but all of these different sort of sub-use cases of, of how to experience the park. What restaurants do I want to go to? What am I, you know, what are my preferences? Sorry, based on what I've already done, uh, Disney delivers um, recommendations on what places I might like to go, what rides I might like to ride. Um, and again, this idea of sort of multiple sub-use cases along the entire journey to just better enhance how, how individuals are experiencing the park. I love this because this is so much more than a marketing play. This is so fundamentally squared in how individuals experience Disney's properties. Um, and in using that experience and that intelligence to just create a better park going experience for everyone, not just for the individual. And so I'll just close here by reinforcing this point of doing and engagement. If we think of the internet as the age of information, um, I think of the internet of things as the age of action and enabling action for consumers. But ultimately the sort of feedback loop that we create by um, attaching sensors to things, by get, by creating this sort of visibility, this layer of context and of data, will stop dead in its tracks if people are just not compelled, people, consumers, are not compelled to engage with these um, activations. And so this is fundamentally about utility, providing actual value, doing so quickly and effectively, tangible value creation, um, and, a, and a word I heard many, many times in my research, instant gratification. Um, so the more consumers are inspired to do in the context of their interactions with brands, the more that the brand and consumer agenda align, which is fundamentally going back to that framework of really the third phase of object voice. This is about brands and consumer agendas aligning to better serve both. Thanks very much. Since you have been very, very efficient in your time, <laughs> There are questions uh, people can ask, and you get to answer them and enlighten them. Yeah, please come to the mic.
It's a great question. Fundamentally, I think the biggest challenge is culture and is um, sensitivity, sensitivity to privacy, to what feels personal, to what feels creepy. And this is a challenge to this happening, um, not only because this is what sort of creates this fickle mentality for us as consumers, but also for brands because <laughs> there's no one silver bullet answer to this. Um, this varies culturally, this varies regionally, this varies based on exposure to technology, exposure to urba urban environments. This is the topic of my next research, so I'm glad that you asked. Um, but yes, fundamentally I think that the cultural challenge is the biggest. Technology is a huge challenge. That's, I think that's why we're seeing so much adoption um, of mobile phones, because it sort of implies an instant scale and an instant access in your back pocket. Um, but really I think uh, to, to really see this realized, sort of this vision um, that I've articulated, or hopefully articulated, uh, the cultural challenges, I think, the most, the biggest. Could you repeat the name of the report for all of us? I will indeed, it's actually up here. Customer Experience in the Internet of Things, Five Ways that Brands, I should know this by, by heart by now, Five Ways that Brands Can Use Sensors to uh, Improve Customer Relationships. Um, how, the do next they get there? how do they get, <laughs> get the report? Um, it's online, it's totally free. Um, you can go to altimetergroupswebsite.com and download the report directly from there. Thank you a lot. Thank Fantastic you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>